All right, good morning, folks. Um, this is your lecture on um, Chapter 13, The Age of Jackson. Let's get going right away. All right, so um, Andrew Jackson, um, he's a very well-known president. Obviously, he's got his, his own age, um, but he's not a very effective leader, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about in Chapter 13. So some of the big things, uh, some of the big important issues and themes that go on throughout um, Jackson's presidency. Number one, um, the spread of democracy. Uh, we start to see more of the common man um, being involved in politics uh, more so than previous, and all land restrictions are taken off of are taken off of, of voting rights. So um, now, not just land owning males can vote; all males, all white males, can can vote. Uh, we also see an introduction of what's called the spoil system, which is a way that uh, Jackson fills up the federal government and his cabinet, uh, which creates a lot of party loyalty, political party loyalty. Um, we see that tariffs are going to cause nullification and this increased sectionalism between the North and South. Um, Jackson, very well known for his Indian removal um, and his commitment to Western, westward, uh, excuse me, westward expansion. And the last thing, the Bank of the United States is going to be something that Jackson is going to want to, to want to destroy, and he will be successful at doing that. All right, and this all stems from the election of 1824. Um, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, William Crawford, and Andrew Jackson were the four guys that were running for president um, during this election. And it, Jackson does actually very, very well. Um, he gets 99 of he gets 99 electoral votes. Um, Adams gets 84. Um, Jackson wins the popular vote, and he gets the the most electoral votes, but he does not get the majority of the electoral votes. So as a result, that the decision has to go to the House of Representatives. And um, Henry Clay, who is also running for president, um, who is kind of out of it at this point, um, is the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives. So he's kind of in charge of deciding uh, the way that the House of Representatives is going to choose. And um, John Quincy Adams kind of strikes a deal with Henry Clay and says, hey, if you get support for me, I win the presidency, you become my Secretary of State. And being a Secretary of State was really kind of a big deal because most presidents that were Secretary or um most individuals that be, that were Secretary of State later became president. All right, so uh, this becomes known as the corrupt bargain of 1824 because this is exactly what happens. Um, the two, uh, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay, kind of swing this little deal. Um, it's very sneaky and weird, but John Quincy Adams becomes president and Jackson loses, even though he had the majority of the electoral votes and the popular vote. So, real bummer. So, John Quincy Adams' presidency is... is very much filled with uh, these ideas of corruption and bargain and things like that. Um, and he was John. He was the son of John Adams, um, former president of the United States. And he was actually a fantastic Secretary of State. He was very influential uh, with the Treaty of Ghent, um, signing the Treaty of Ghent after the War of 1812, obtaining the Oregon Territory and purchasing Florida from Spain. But he wasn't very good as a president. All right. Um, so then we see the the election of 1828 and that's kind of a rematch um, between Jackson and John Quincy Adams from the previous election okay and this becomes a very dirty election John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson are saying a lot of bad things about one another their parties are saying a lot of bad things about one another okay and Jackson is portrayed as kind of this um, this murderer who uh, had killed many people in duels and brawls and executions and kind of stemming back from the things that he did in Florida um, Jackson's mother was said to be a prostitute and his dad was said to be a mulatto. Okay. So some real bad things, uh, being said about, about Andrew Jackson. Um, on the other side, John Adams was, uh, was labeled a lawyer or labeled a, uh, gambler. It was said that he brought in, um, a lot of like a gambling ring into, um, into the white house. And he, and he had also purchased a, a Russian prostitute when um, there were some diplomatic things going on over in Europe. So so both sides were, were really at fault here. Uh, but Jackson's going to win the electoral, or he, he gets the most electoral votes and wins the presidency of 1828. And as you can see, a lot of his support comes from the South and the West over here, but he does do all right up in, um, up in the Northeast, okay? He wins New York, Pennsylvania, all right? So Jackson pretty much dominates this this election and um, he gets a lot of the support from the common people because he comes from kind of humble backgrounds okay and uh, because he comes from these kind of humble backgrounds he, he he sets up what's called the spoil system okay and this was his way of kind of getting new blood into 
into the um, into the federal government. So what he does is he takes like supporters, his cronies, his friends, people that were going to be politically aligned with him, and he puts them in office throughout the federal government and removes people that were already in office. Okay. Um, and he argues that this is, this is this is a good thing that you know it's good to have uh, a new fresh set of eyes that are in in the federal government and being involved. But as a result, um, it's really not that good because it's filled with crooks and inexperienced people. So um, the the federal government actually loses like millions of dollars because people are literally stealing from the federal government. Um, so the spoil system not really um, not really an effective um, act that uh, that Jackson does, but um, one thing that it does do is it promotes Americans to pick a political party and be very loyal to that. And uh, with Jackson, this is we, where we really start to see political loyalty. And, uh, you know, diehards of, of any political party seem to be with that party through thick and thin. And um, this was the spoil system was a way for common um, common men to get involved in politics and, and to be loyal to a political party. So that was that was a spoil system, not very ineffective or not very effective by, um, by Andrew Jackson. Um, the next big thing that um, comes up in Jackson's presidency are, are the issues with tariffs and the growing sections in between North and South. Okay, so the, the tariffs, as we talked about from Chapter 12, well, were um, passed in the North to help with manufacturing, okay? And these were going to protect the manufacturing of the United States because it would make European goods more expensive to buy. As a result, Americans are buying from um, the North. Okay, so the North really liked the tariffs, but as a result of this, the South hated the tariffs. This is because uh, when the United States places tariffs on imported European goods, the European nations are going to also place tariffs on their goods, okay, on the United States goods. So um, the Southerners were actually still, still very much open to the free world market, okay, they were selling their goods. Um, throughout the world, particularly to Europe, their cotton, tobacco, um, their uh, rice and indigo and all these things. They're still selling to Europe, but now Europe is not buying because it costs so much to buy American goods. Okay, So the South hates the tariffs, and um, it, it really increases the sectionalism between North and South. And John C. Calhoun of, of South Carolina says, I never use the word nation in speaking of the United States. I always use the word union or confederacy. We are not a nation, but a union, a confederacy of equal and sovereign states. Okay, so as you can see here, John C. Calhoun does not think that the United States is very united. Okay, and sees that um, that the North and South are very different places and um, does not see them as being part of one country. John C. Calhoun is going to, going to be very instrumental in, um, in the nullification process and as we approach a civil war. Okay, and... <clears throat> The, the Treaty of 1828, this is where a lot of a uh, lot of heat starts to come, which was known as the Treaty of Abominations. Okay, And the Treaty of Abominations, um, what, what it does is it increases the tariff rate from 23% to 37%. Okay, So making those European goods way more expensive for Americans to buy. Um, and South Carolina is very upset about this. And John C. Calhoun is very upset about this. And he writes um, the South Carolina Exposition. And this is kind of a pamphlet that really says, you know what, screw this tariff, this is terrible. Um, states should nullify the treaty or the tariff of 1828. Okay, And this idea of nullification, remember we talked about this with um, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions after the Alien and Sedition Acts. And nullification, uh, he says that it's the state's law or it's the state's right to be able to just strike down the law and, and, and say that federal government law is unjust and that it doesn't need to be listened to Okay, within the, within the borders of that state. So South Carolina says that they're going to nullify the law or the tariff of 1828. And these South Carolinians, which are known as nullies, um, they are, uh, they're, not, they're trying to nullify the law. And President Jackson is very angered by this. They, they said that they weren't going to pay the money in the t uh, for the tariffs. Um, and um, Andrew Jackson is ready to invade South Carolina. He's preparing a war. Okay, He's got troops ready. He's got arms ready. He's ready to go into South Carolina and, um, and pretty much dominate if he needs to. Um, Henry Clay, which was a guy by that is known as the great compromiser. Okay. And he comes up with the tariff of 1833, which is a compromise, um, that says that over the next 10 years, what the United States, uh, what the, what Congress will do is, is start to decrease the, the, um, 
the percentage of the tariff so that it gets back to the level of where it was at in 1816, okay? And South Carolina doesn't really have much of a choice. They have to accept this, okay? Um, they're by themselves. They're uh, they're kind of between a rock and a hard place here, and, and they do accept the compromise, and war is avoided at this point, okay? But as this is going through and after the Congress passes the tariff of 1833, Congress is going to pass what's called the force bill. Okay, and the force bill says that um, Jackson has the right to send in the military to collect tariffs if a nation is going to nullify the tariff. Um, and it just kind of as a um, kind of a, a, a poke at the federal government after this passes, South Carolina and John C. Calhoun nullify this law. <laughs> um, okay, just a couple a couple more things real quick. Um, Andrew Jackson is very well known for his um, his instrumental role in the Indian removal. Um, Native Americans um, w w that were still part of the area east of the Mississippi, um, Andrew Jackson wanted them out, and he wanted to move them west of the Mississippi because he wanted to expand the U.S. territory. Okay, and um, even there were there were five tribes that were known as the five civilized tribes: right? the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Creek, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole tribes. Okay, and these five tribes. They adopted writing and reading and dressing the same as Americans and things like that. And some of them even had slaves. But Jackson didn't really care. Okay, He wanted them out. And um, even one of these tribes of Cherokee, they moved this to uh, the, the Georgia legislator in 1828. And uh, John Marshall rules in favor of the Native Americans. And he says that, you know what, you don't need to, have, you don't need to move. Okay, this, It's unconstitutional to, to force you to be moved off your land. And um, Andrew Jackson responds to this by saying, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. And he basically says, you know what, good luck, because um, these Indians are moving whether you like it or not. And this is what we see uh, with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and that's known as the Trail of Tears. Okay, And basically, Native Americans are rounded up, uh, about 100,000 of them, and they're moved to the Oklahoma Territory. And all of those five tribes, um, along with others, the five civilized tribes, along with others, um, are moved to the Oklahoma Territory. And this is a terrible time in American history, okay? Because many of these individuals, as they're walking, um, they die in uh, sickness and malnutrition and, you know, the weather and things like that. So this is just a map that kind of shows, you know, the Seminoles were down here, the Cherokee here, all right, the Chickasaw down here, and um, where they had to move to um, west of the Mississippi to Oklahoma. Okay, now the last thing that I want to talk about here is Andrew Jackson going after the Bank of the United States. So the Bank of the United States was not part of the federal government, but it was very, very powerful. And the federal government had, had uh, mainly all of its money um, invested into the Bank of the United States. But Jackson is not a fan of the bank, and he says that it's not very accountable to people, but more so the wealthy elite in the United States. Okay, so um, he, he decides that he is not going to reissue the the um, the charter that the bank had originally that expired in 1836, um, he wasn't going to wait for the bank to just die out. He was going to he was going to try to kill it himself. So basically, what Jackson does is he orders federal deposits, so federal money, to be removed from the bank and moved to smaller banks, which are known as pet banks. Okay, and these pet banks were just supporters of Jackson that um, he basically gave the money to to destroy um, the Bank of the United States. And the Bank of the United States is going to basically have um, a, a very big effect on the U.S. economy and is going to kind of set the stage for a financial meltdown um, after Jackson's presidency. So not a very good or smart move on Jackson's part here. Um, and the, the last thing I just want to bring up is the ideas of, of Jacksonian democracy, which is a term that we'll hear throughout U.S. history. And basically what Jackson, Jacksonian democracy means is that Jackson tries to bring more democracy to the common man, getting common men involved in politics because he was from humble beginnings, you know, because he was kind of your backwoods um, individual, okay? And the universal suffrage for all white men now in the United States, as I mentioned earlier, um, voting restrictions are dropped. All white men are, are now able to vote, not just landowning men. And even though the spoil system was really kind of a stupid thing, it did allow a common man to be part of government, um, part of politics, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and the last couple of things here, um, manifest destiny, which is an idea that the um, United States um, citizens feel like they need to move west towards the Pacific Ocean, is going to start kind of with Jackson um, as he wants to expand westward and he... Um, kind of influences Americans to want to do the same. And the last thing, popular campaigning. Um, politicians after Jackson are really going to start running for office um, to appeal to the common man. 
All right, that's all I got.